What's going down this Danny Houston podcast? I am Danny Houston. Check it out, man. We uh we got a real special guest today, man. You know what I'm saying? Uh H Town legend. You know what I'm saying? Been doing this thing, man. I'm talking about coming from the Christian side of things. And he hit us over the head with that pop in my trunk. You know what I'm saying? Be responsible for a few other things we'll get into later on, man. But listen, today's guest, man, you might know him as New Wine. You might have heard of him as Wino. But he goes by Hefe Wine today. What's going on, man? What's up, man? You speaking the history, dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. Some people just know me, like you say, by new wine. Some people just know me by wine oh. And some people only know me by Hefe wine. But I own all those monikers. You know? Is it like a Pimp C thing, like personalities, or is this just you going through life and evolving and this is where you at? You know what I'm it's saying? A, it's evolving. It's growth, you know. Because how I even got into the Christian hip-hop, number one, I ain't even know what that was. Because I came out of the streets. I was facing 15 years in prison. Judge didn't even give me a bond. Like, they was trying to get rid of me. This was 15 for what? What, what was the uh, charge at the time? Oh, man, that was based on... Because um, you was I, in the I, car theft and all that, right? Yeah, I, I had a car theft ring, though. Like, I had, a, I had a warehouse, all kinds of stuff. Oh, no, shit. Like, chop so, shop, all that type of... Yeah, the real traditional chop shop. Uh, and it went on for a long time from the age of 14 to 18 and the reason why I was so successful I had a a a liaison a redneck out of Port of Texas and he had a connect where we sold the car parts back to General Motors so the only thing we would steal is General Motor cars so it was oh y'all getting some money then oh yeah I was making that bread young making that bread man and uh all my partners were slanging dope. And I tried. I sold dope one time, man, and we <laughs> got chased by the cops. I said, you know what? It's too much no, activity. <laughs> too much activity. It take too long. You know what I'm saying? It's too, it's too many guns that can come out. I'd rather something that, you know, I can be slick at and just get to it. And I was approached by, I think I had stole some stuff, and I showed up at this hood cap place. They used to have hook, actual hood cap places where people would bring hood caps mm-hmm. and sell them back in the day. And I was approached by this this redneck with a big old stomach. He was skinny with a huge stomach. This like you was a kid though, fourteen years old. Yeah, around it, yeah. I was around yeah. thirteen when I met him though. And he was like, "Man, if you can bring me this or bring me that, I'll pay you some decent money." You know. He was a man of his word, hmm. so I, I cranked it up, bro. What is, what is he asking you for? At the time, I think he was asking for like Chevrolet and GMC truck tailgates. They probably still steal them tailgates to this day, snatch them off the cars or whatever. Hmm. Just just the actual gate. Yeah. No shit. I was getting seventy five dollars back then per gate, so we was man knocking them off <laughs> back to back. So <laughs> that's how all of that started. My partners who was selling dope. At first, I didn't tell them what I was doing. They were like, "Man, where you moving this at? What, what you, what's your connect?" <laughs> like, you know, they didn't know what else I was getting money. But uh, I kept it real, real, real quiet, real quiet, man. And I was always a person that, uh, no matter what I did, I wanted to perfect it. You know. And my mama said I was a little mastermind. I, was, I didn't even know what that was back then. She used to call me a little mastermind. I guess because I would be so... Scheming. Trying to figure something yeah, out. Yeah. 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 Well, I start, 
how I first started making money, I would like fix little radios and stuff like that when I was eight years old and fix people TVs. I figured that junk out early. Hmm. Like we like I don't even know how I knew it, because you know it ain't no YouTube to teach you. You know what I'm yeah, saying? No, it's real trial and error. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. trial and error. I done been shocked. <laughs> I tell my kids I done been electrocuted so many times just just trying to learn how components work. And uh I just, man, I was that experimental type. You know, to this day, I invent things. You know, I got patents on stuff, all kinds of stuff. People wouldn't know I'm an inventor, you know, just by, you know, uh, them just thinking I'm a rapper or maybe a producer, but I'm much more than that, you feel me? Yeah. When, and this is uh, this is coming up in Fifth War. Yeah. But but in this time, though, because, I mean, I'm just trying to guess era rise, like, you seeing like kind of like the start of rap a lot now, that type of stuff. Mid eighties, uh, and the nineties, yeah. Yep. Uh, Jay Prince lived one street over. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, okay, you got you can't just say that. You got to tell me what you know. What I'm saying how is this living one street over from Jay Prince? How is man, that? just the just the the stuff you would hear, and you know the the streets would put put gas to it and things of that nature. But as I've grown and known through the years, man, I understand and I have a high level of respect. Some people have fear and respect, but I see them much deeper. And uh, just bringing them up, I just want to talk about this because nobody really talks about this with Jay Prince. Jay Prince, like just as a friend, he stopped some wars that could have been bad. Like, I've seen him help people and dudes finna go to war and finna kill each other and he would get in the middle of it and stop it. You feel what I'm saying? And not, it was no money involved, no nothing. Out of his busy schedule, out of his grind, all the vastest amount of companies he owned, go way out his way to stop two, two black brothers from fighting each other. So when, or killing each other, so with the Drake and the and the Kanye, I I know that firsthand. Hmm. You know, it was a misunderstanding between me and Trey back in the day, and his anger was, as I look back in retrospect, his anger was understood, because he had a song that was growing and building when Pop My Trunk just dropped, and kind of derailed what he had going on, but what he didn't know. Is that I had produced a song a year ago. My wife telling me to take my gum out of my mouth. She the only one who can talk to me like that, by the way. You don't mind, I'll put it right here. Let me give you. There you go. But uh, Trey didn't know I produced that song a year earlier than that, and it was for Mike Jones. When he for me, and what he was hearing was a demo because I was going to sell it to another artist and it had Paul Wall on it but it felt like I was just, you know, I took his idea and went with it. So before me and him could have a discussion about it, things got out of hand. And Jay didn't want to see two good brothers, you know, go at it. See, people misconstrued me because they knew me as a Christian hip-hop artist. They don't know me from the streets. And that was the blessing. It was good I came over to that Christian side or that I was doing rap because the dude I was in the streets, I was, you know, I was out of control. And Jay actually called a meeting and had us both sit down and discuss our differences. And it was squashed and me and Trey been cool ever since. Hmm. And, and then another instant with the, uh, the Iggy Azalea situation. People didn't know, you know, T.I., you know, got offended by some stuff. And I could I could have took offense, but uh, things got out of hand where, you know, I thought something was finna come my way. And then it was finna get real tragic. And Jay again. Here we go again. Oh, he came in the, in the midst of that situation. Yes, he did. Is he... I, I, I know him... As a, a as a wise businessman and a peacemaker, so when I hear anything else, I don't even care about it. I know him personally, you know. 
And that's what happens. That's what happens with me. You've probably heard stuff about me, but people don't, they don't really know the person if they don't know the person. It's people judging from a distance and taking hearsays. You feel me? It's just Jay ain't finna sit up and defend all of that. He just gonna be himself. Y'all say whatever. You know. And uh yeah, man, it was just a just a strong dude. And he he has a gift I've never had. And the gift that I see real strong on him is how how to talk to anybody. Like anybody. Like not only that, but he know how to bring people together. Like like none other. You know, that's a strong gift, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, he's, I mean, he the GOAT, man. You know what I'm saying? He, he is the he GOAT. He is the GOAT. It is what he it is. is. The goat. Man, you said, uh, you was like, you know, about things, you know, misconceptions about yourself. Is there anything that you heard where you like, man, I just, I hate that this is what people try to label me as, or this is the, the, the perception that people have, you know what I mean? Well, uh, you know, a lot of times, um, us as men, we have to carry ourselves a certain way so nobody would try us. You know, it's almost like a prison mentality. You know, if you don't walk around that certain way, somebody's going to bomb the tissue. My, my thing has been I've never, I never walked a certain way for anybody to know who I am. So it's confusion, you know. Oh, he, he's the gospel dude. He's this, this, and that, you know. But then they meet dudes I grew up with, and they be like, bro, don't touch that dude. That's all I got to tell you, you know. Or they see me speaking, uh, or should I say soft-spoken about an issue, about love, family, and things of that nature. And people may take that as softness. But anytime a man is passionate about family, that's the man you really don't want to mess with because that actually means he's a protector. He's willing to die for his. And just people have like a, a dull uh, sense of what real really is. And I grew up different. I grew up seeing men that were actually real and wasn't just talking they were real, they were real. Let me give me an example. I've talked about this before and I teach my sons. Because my old man taught me. When I was a little kid, my daddy would give me, like, examples. And by the way, I was one of the only dudes who had a daddy at the house. And um, he would say, you see that little dude over there playing? You see that big dude? He, he would ask me, what do they have in common? And I would say, nothing. You know, one big, one little. He'd say, they both men. And when you test a man, a man always had the ability to kill you, son. No matter if he little or big, he's still a man. And I kept that with me, and I grew up seeing it. I had friends in the hood, you know, they look, they look soft, you know what I'm saying? Look like you can push them over, and they were real killers. I'm talking 10, 15, 20 bodies. And... They didn't look like the dude hard with his chest out, what's up, all that. Ain't have one tattoo. Look like you just push them down the street. And they would pull that gun and let it go in a minute. And, and no remorse. I learned that uh, the perception of a person doesn't make him who they are. Hmm. So you can never judge them based on that. And You got to get to know people. Yeah. You got to get to know people. And another thing is, uh, as I got famous and got all the money and was traveling all in Hollywood, New York, I seen how people were treated that were famous with money. And, and I also seen how the famous people treated the regular man. I never liked it. That's why I stopped. Man, I, I didn't go to no parties. I, I almost got to the point where I didn't even want to be around famous people because I would see it so much. My whole career, I've treated everybody the same. The dude that got nothing, full respect. I want to hear what he got to say. I'm, I'm, if I can give him something or teach him something to come up, I'm, I'm, I so passionately want to do that for him. The dude that's up, I show him respect. The same thing. And a lot of times the dudes that's up and got money, 
they think they can treat people a certain type of way or they can look down on somebody. Oh, bro, I can't stand that. So what I did as I got famous, I kept hanging with the people on the bottom. And they used to say, nigga, what you doing? Over there? Man, I'm comfortable over here because at least these people are real. Who do you think you are? I, I never liked that, bro. I've always been for the underdog. So that's why you've never heard of, oh, wine, no birthday bash, jefe wine, party. Mm. Or like celebrities do now, when they give or help somebody, they make they tell the whole world, hey, I'm going to do this. I'm giving away. I'm giving this to this family. I've done it for years. But you'll never hear people about it. I don't want you, everybody to know. I just want the most high to know. I want God to know. Because I ain't doing it for a pat on the back or to get some type of puff up. I don't care about that. I care about when I go home at night. Nobody's around. I look myself in the mirror. and Do I see a man? Do I see a bitch? Do I see a, a manipulator, a weak dude, an insecure dude? Or do I see somebody that believes in himself, somebody that cares about others, that want to see other people rise up and do something in their life? I got to see a real man when I look in that mirror. And I ain't got nothing to do with somebody patting me on the back, telling me a good job. Hmm. So that uh, that has been a blessing and a curse for my my business, my gifts. Because I can, to this day, I can outwork anybody in the business. You know, I had, uh, this was years ago, Maurice Starr, one of the only producers to ever make a billion dollars, by the way, being a producer since you produce. He's a dude who did uh, new, uh, new Kids on the Block, the Backstreet Boys or whatever. He, he oh, Mar yeah, used to wear. The, yeah, I know you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. old dude. Old dude. What used to wear the uh, the, the 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 sailor or whatever it was. Some type yeah, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I know that's you're talking that's about. Him, yeah, yeah. I met him years ago. I was in Hollywood. She was probably somewhere I I couldn't even afford to be. You know, in this restaurant, the plates each pl the cheapest plate was like two hundred fifty dollars. Like I like. I said, y'all definitely paying for this. I ain't paying for this. <laughs> but I met him there, and uh, I had this artist that uh, Master P wanted to sign. It was a, a, a white girl. She was from the country, but she could blow like a black chick out of, out of the choir. Like, she was cold, boy. And uh, he started hanging around me as I did work. I pumped out beats and sent them off. And he's been around a lot of producers. He know the beginning stage all the way and he said, man, he said, dude, you outwork anybody I've ever met. Me and Daz Dillinger from the Dog Pound, Snoop Dogg's cousin. Uh, I knew his mother. And his mother kept trying to get us together. Kept trying, because see, at the time, I was doing the Christian hip hop. I was just going to ask, how do you meet Daz's mom? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's a random meet, dog. <laughs> I know, it's crazy. <laughs> I was on a TV show and... Uh, I was on a TV show in L.A., and I ran into her. His mother is a preacher. People didn't know that. You know, Snoop's auntie. She, did pray. she said, I've been praying for them knuckleheads forever. That's why he didn't go to prison. That's why they ain't dead, you know. <laughs> and they'll tell you, yeah, that's why we ain't dead. That's why we ain't with the prison. It's, it's dad's mama, boy. So she was super sweet, but she just, she was adamant. Like, Kevin, right, you going to get with my son? And she, I guess she did the same thing to him, so. Me and him decided to do an album back in the day. I released it. I probably re-release it. And uh, I showed up at his house with my equipment. And way back before Jokers was recording in their living room or at a hotel, I was doing it. Dad was like, man, what the, you show up with a mic and this and that? I said, now just get to work. In two days, I produced the whole album. And we wrote to it and everything. And he told me out of his own mouth. He said, bro, I just ain't never seen nobody know how to work like this. He said, bro, I, I used to produce Tupac. And he cold with this. But Tupac was write and record. You produce, write, and record in the time. He just, I said, yeah. I said, bro, I just, when I'm on it, I'm on it, you know. And uh, why did I bring that up? You got to tell me. Why we I talking about dads, uh... Where were you going with that? I don't know. You just started yeah, talking about going, meeting yeah, Daz, meeting Daz T-Lady. We went somewhere else. I don't know. I'll be going down the street, man. 
And um, but I I uh, I think we talking about work ethic or something. Just working. Yeah, work yeah. ethic. Yeah. But uh, oh yeah, and Dad's cold, but his work ethic. That's what I'm gonna beast. say. You telling me, and I'm like, for what I know about Dad's, he one of them ones oh, who get in there and bang him out. Oh, bro, he's he was something, man. I learned I learned so much. And anytime I get around somebody that got good a good gift or a great gift or profound gift, I always it always rub off on me. Like I I take a little, I'm gonna take a little bit of that. I'm take a little bit of that, you know, and I add it to my arsenal. Okay, but, sidebar on some nerd out producer shit. What y'all was using? Uh, Rolling eighteen eighty, mm. ASR ten. Mm. Yeah, I was in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's old school right there. Uh, Lauren Hill did a whole album on that eighteen eighty. That's when uh, digital hard hard disc recording really just came out around that time. They were saying, man, you need a vocal booth. You can't be slapping no mic right in the middle of the floor. All this sound, but I. I had certain settings that I, I set, and I learned it from a dude out of, in Atlanta. Uh, one of the, the first producers that produced Tony Braxton and got uh, Usher started, a dude by the name of Tim Thomas. And uh, he used to love my voice. He said, bro, you're, nobody in the game got a voice like you. And he had this beautiful house, man, in, in the country, man, and it had wooden floors in Atlanta. And he would take that mic and put it right in the middle of that floor. And I'm like, man, my voice going to be horrible. He used to say, no, it ain't. And he had these perfect settings, boy. My voice used to just light up on it. So I took that from him <laughs> and got to do it. I remember when we did the hooker hooker, bro. And, wait, uh, wait, 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 wait. What you had to do with the hooker hooker? I produced it. I'm the one that released it. It was on my label and everything. What? You didn't even know that, uh. <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. You produce Hooker Hooker? Kiati used to be signed to me. Yeah. yeah. You know it was just a remake of that old Six Shot beat. Yeah. yeah. But I, I had to make that Six Shot beat was too gangster. I had to make it more fun so they could dance to it. And uh, everybody was showing up to go to the studio. They showed up at a hotel. They're like, well, what are we doing here? Meeting or something? I said, no, nah, you're going to record. This is the studio. They were like, what? So that was, they was tripping about how I did my thing, you know. I love, I used to love recording outside of the studio just to get them out of that mindset and just just to get them in a, because when you still show up at a studio, you know, jokers be getting in the zone, trying to, you know, getting that vibe. I like to catch a dude outside of the vibe because you get a little something else out of it. You get a little, because when you get in your vibe, okay, that's your gift. But sometimes a little realness leaves. Get that natural, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you catch a joker outside just his natural raw element, you're going to get something else out of it. You know? So I used to like doing that, setting people up like that. <laughs> you just tripped me out with this hooker hooker thing, man. Oh, yeah, bro. Okay, all right. We're we going to come back around to that. You, you just, you just, we just went all over. So, okay. You forgot I was on the end of the song. Yeah. <laughs> so... It's 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 just a trip, baby. A little history. That's man, that's crazy. Okay, so all right. Yeah. Back to your teens. You still in these cars and all that. What was um like? How did you end up getting to the situation where you got the fifteen years or were facing the fifteen years? Oh man, I was. Um, Cause you weren't you ain't doing music at this time. You just no, straight. No, no. I didn't even think about. It. I had no idea I would even do music. I I wanted to be. Uh, I thought I was going to be some type of crime syndicate, like organized crime dude or something like that because I was so good at what I did. But is your whole ring just a bunch of y'all kids? Or is it some no, adults? It was like? grown men working for me. At, at, by the time I turned 15, I had grown men working for me. It was just too much money coming in and out. You know? And uh, I needed them. I needed them and, and old adult things because I was too young to... To lease places and buy cars and stuff because I would show up and they're like, I ain't selling this kid this car. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I had all this money. So I learned that it was certain things I couldn't do without them. You know, I ain't even get a driver's license until I turned 20. I drove illegally for years because I was just an outlaw. I didn't even care. But I remember one time I had, they had caught me uh, trying to steal a car. 
and it's it's called attempted attempted auto theft. And the judge was like, you know, I was a real skinny kid. This judge like, you gotta promise me you ain't gonna do this no more. You know, I'm gonna be lenient, cause you know, this is your first offense like this. And I told the judge, I said, I said, you, if you let me get out of this, I promise you I won't steal again. He let me out two days later, I went right back before the same judge for auto theft. <laughs> so you can see that the court got sick of me, man. They were sick because I wouldn't stop. I had told. Uh, how long had you been on your run with that? Like, how, would you like ooh, three, four man. years in the game? How long are you in the game before you get to this? Point? From, I started at 14. It was 14 to 18. 18 years old. And oh, 18, yeah. You're going with the big boys now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was time to ride it on out. And uh, I had told uh, I had told a friend of mine, you know, I never went in clubs. I never liked clubs. But I used to go to clubs all the time. It was just to steal cars out the parking lot. And the only time I ever went in a club back then is the police caught me trying to steal the car. The security, the HPD that was working, they caught, they handcuffed me and took me inside the club. It was the first time I seen the inside of a club, and they took me to the office, and then a fight broke out in the club. Somebody got stabbed with bottles and all that, and they came in and they said, "You lucky, we got other people to arrest," and they uncuffed me. And when they uncuffed me and let me go, I finished stealing the same car. They stopped me and I left. That's how bad I was at stealing them cars. I had to get to that cake. So the system was, was exhausted with me. You feel me? And they seen no reason to give me a bond at the time. But it was more than me just, you know, facing 15 years in prison because the things that happened to me prior. You know, I had got shot once in the head and the bullet didn't go through my skull and it, it hit right by my temple. I think it's on this side, you know, this side of my head. And um, I said, man, you know, I kind of brushed that off. Like, you young, you, you doing stupid stuff. I didn't see the seriousness. Just a warning. Yeah, it was a, didn't even see it really. Then I get shot in my face. And this was before you had to sit down and all that? Yeah, this is before this. I got oh, shot. Oh, 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 you getting hella warnings? You just yeah, hella man. warnings. By the time I I got this happened when I was eighteen when I got shot in the face though, and I literally died, come back to life, and then I heard doctors saying I shouldn't be alive. So that I couldn't shake that off, but I was still stupid. I was still dumb though, and uh, when I got locked up, it forced me to look at that. It forced me to look at. How many of my partners got killed? And what's so crazy, before I got locked up, a friend of mine got shot in the same spot and died instantly. Dude named Peanut. Rest in peace. And um, I was forced to look at, it ain't no coincidence you're still alive. You done been a shootout. I'm talking, we busting, but you still here. And that's when, uh, Everything began to change for me. And I, I remember I remember telling God, I said, you know, I don't know why I keep doing these things. I don't know how to stop, you know. I guess I'm a bad person, but, I, and I didn't really know if he was real or not. I heard my mom and them talking about him, but I ain't never really knew, you know. And the first time I ever prayed is when I got shot that last time. I said, all I know is I'm still alive, but I keep getting, I keep doing these bad things. So I said, God, give me a sign. And the day out, the first time I went to court, uh, the judge, they ain't, the judge didn't even see me. He just turned me around, you know. But that same day, I, I, a dude approached me, and who didn't know my story, didn't know nothing, a little white dude, and. Uh, the Bible says, God take the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. He use anything to speak. Or he'll use something you wouldn't respect or think is something. You feel what I'm saying? 
And this little white dude said, you know, it's a reason why God spared your life. It blowed me away. I'm like, and he said, it's something he wants you to do. I went back to that cell. I started looking for Bibles. I remember this dude like, ah, this nigga got jailhouse religion. Everybody want to turn to God when you get it. Everybody's a preacher. Everybody, hallelujah, nigga. Jailhouse religion. That's what they call it. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> you get back in the street, nigga, you're going right back to the guns, messing with the freaks, acting bad. But y'all want to get holy in here. It's a bad rap, right? And I remember the dude, he, he made an impression on me. And I said, man, I, at this point, I said, I ain't finna be playing with God. Everybody else can play with him. I ain't playing with him. And I remember saying, God, if you get me out of this, I'll never steal again. I'll never be in the streets like that again. And, bro, I got out of that situation, and I hit the streets. And How do you end up Because you're looking at 15. How you bro, it was crazy. What they did, they... <laughs> The thing about me, I was, I was one of those, I was a street dude, but I was intelligent, real sharp, and it used to either make a cop or a judge mad, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, or it well, made- You don't think you're a smart ass. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> or it gave me favor. Mm. And it was like, people like, I don't understand why you would even be doing this. Look what kind of mind you have. You know, and your attorney, my mom and them will bring stuff to court that I built or made and people can't even believe it, you know. You know, I've I, I made stuff that could put a light company out of the building. Like, they was like, no, this, they almost. There's more was, to it than this, than what he's he dealing with right now. Yeah. yeah, so they put me on, he decided, instead of sending me to prison, to put me on a 10-year probation. You know. So this this whole thing you having with this guy, this conversation, this is like where y'all in the county or something? Yeah. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. County. Tenth floor gladiator. And oh, whoever yeah, yeah, listening, yeah, yeah, yeah. if they know about that tenth floor back then, boy, it was ooh, it was on and popping. It was jokes getting hit as soon as they walk in there. Like it was it was on. But uh and uh, my mama's house was all the way live. My brother was trapping out the back window of my mama's house and she didn't even know it. So I knew if I was in that environment matter of time for because probation I, everybody knew probation is one foot in prison one foot out like if you get in an argument at Walmart you're gone so I said I can't be here plus I was used to being on my own having my own money now I have nothing they took everything so I found myself homeless another part people don't know about me and this how I discovered my rapping abilities didn't even think about it man and I was about to lose my mind because I was used to balling. My partners in the hood, they thought I was smoking. This nigga is homely. What? This nigga smoking. Look at his shoes. You know when your shoes get dirty. You raggedy. You're the great. He's smoking, man. He out of his mind. So, man, they was talking about me. But I held on to that promise. It was killing me. I held to that. I could have did my little connects. Boom. Been back on my feet in a week. But I made that promise. And I remember being outside of this homeless shelter in Fourth Ward, man. And a bunch of Mexicans used to be out there. It used to be called a riot center. And, um, and I just would rap and talk about my problems. And I'd be rapping to God and talking about my problems. Rapping to God, talking about what I used to do in the streets. Rapping to God, talking about, you know, he spared my life. And these Mexicans, they used to trip out because I was... Bro, I got nothing but meat on my body. I was so skinny back then, bro. And they say, man, this deep voice comes from the skinny dude. They used to say I sound chopped and screwed. Hmm. So I seen they liked it, so I just kept doing it almost almost every day. And they, you know, to one day, uh, this dude pulled up in a Mercedes, a black dude. And I was used to seeing, like, nice cars pull up with white people and all that getting out dropping off clothes or giving donations and then leaving. So that wasn't nothing abnormal. But he got out and kind of came up to the crowd of me and these Mexicans. And he was listening. And then he went, he left that and went into the uh, into the uh, the center and left. And then this woman who, who was a secretary, she came outside 
and say, do you know who that is who just left? I said, no. Nah. She said, that was Kevin Bass from the Houston Astros. Hmm. He just wrote you a $1,000 check. We don't even know your name. That light cut on. Because I'm from the streets. I'm a so hustler. I, I can get some money doing this. <laughs> there it is. I said, man, they really like this this deep voice. I ain't know what a 16 bar was. Like, I was throwing out. I was just rapping. But, and I took that money. Went to Kmart. Started buying them little black tapes with all that air in it. And started flipping it. Flipping it, flipping it. Gathered money, saved money, man. But you was, because you you were rapping acapella on these. Straight acapella on it. I remember, <laughs> I remember a dude say, nigga, you expect me to pay this? Nigga, ain't no beat ain't on no this beat. <laughs> <laughs> And he bought it anyway. I was pushing it, boy. And uh, until I ended up, you know, having enough money to get some whack beats and stuff. And, uh, um, Shout out to your first producer. No offense, whoever this brother is. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Gonna feel yeah it, it's a blessing. Yeah. Everybody, you, all us start out in stages. You producer, so I mean, everybody has stages. So, and uh, man, uh, I ended up saving money, man, and started working on my my, you know, a whole album, whole project, and in between that time, my name grew because all the churches was like. You know, the thing they would ask, is he cussing? No, he don't cuss on it. He, he mentioning God. like, But they were like, he's kind of rough, though. He's talking about guns and all this stuff. So they, But they said, man, we want him to come. So I would show up at these churches. Man, I was nervous around these church folks and the little kids and stuff. And it was hard for me not to cuss. Sometimes I was cussing in that. They'd be like, 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 like. Be up there like, you know, I told them motherfuckers and I'm like, oh, it's broken. <laughs> Church like, like it was hard, man. So, but, you know, the little grandmas in the churches, you know, they just fell in love with me. We like him, you know. The, some of the preachers are like, man, I, I like you, man. You, you real. You can tell you ain't fake with whatever you doing. <laughs> like, so that was encouraging for me to keep going and my name grew. And this is still early too in like Christian hip hop like genre. You know this is like saying? 90, 90, late 94, yeah. you know, 95. It's crazy. I was talking to my boy E yeah. Red on the way over here and I was telling him I was finna interview you and he was like, man, he said, why no? New wine. Man, when I was a kid, man, he came to Windsor Village. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, yeah. still remember this, man. You come to Windsor Village and, and perform it. You know what I'm saying? And he was in the youth program. That's still sticking up to this day. You know why they remember me? Now think about it. You church, people got on suits, people speaking polite, and all of a sudden this dude wearing all dicky, dickies, pants slab, big old afro out, or braided down, and the music is shaking everything. You know, that's, I left an impression because that wasn't happening in the South at all. It wasn't happening in the church community at all. My partner's on the West Coast, Gospel Gangsters, shout out, uh, Solo, he passed away in 2020. Right when we did a project, right after we did a project, he passed away, man. It's called Problem Solve. So if y'all listening, go pick that up. It's uh, New Wine and Solo. Uh, it's called Problem Solve. But they were, they were doing it before me. They ex Crips and Bloods, real ex Crips and Bloods. And they just started rapping, and it was on that street level. And they were the only ones I could relate to. Because they had Christian hip hop. Them dudes was, excuse me. It was corny. It was, it was corny. corny. It was a little too soft. I didn't, I didn't, I'm like, man, these dudes, you know, uh-uh. But them, psh, I knew exactly where they was coming from, their frustrations and how they was talking to God. But I was the only one in the South doing it. And it blew up. And That's what I asked you, is that how you were able to come up? Because it was on a, a clip on a documentary where they was like, He's a long way from being homeless. This is like 2001 and they flashed in the crib. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. That boy was moving them units over there with Robert oh. Gilliman, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you even mentioning Robert Gilliman mean you know the business. I know Robert, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah bro. Yeah. Oh, wait. I was, man, I was such a... Let's go back to what we said earlier. Couldn't nobody outwork me. I'm not, I'm not stealing no more. I'm not in the streets. So whatever I did, I told... Well, my family know this. In the beginning parts of my career, as I went up so quick and so fast, for five years straight, 
I only got two and a half hours of sleep a day. No joke, no hype. So I reached in my closet one day to get my shoes and blacked out for nine hours. My body like, all right, nigga, we cutting off on you because you, you going too hard. Damn. Somebody find you in there? How you, like? I woke up. My family thought I was gone. My wife was like, I seen your car out there. I guess I thought you got picked up. <laughs> I'm gone in the closet, you know. And because uh, I was afraid of being back home. I was afraid of my family going in reverse. And I knew this was all I had. So I worked it, you know. I was a billionaire, an old white billionaire gave me my own TV show when he heard my story. I came on this uh, show, I was invited to get on this show and um, I told my story and they ratings went through the roof. So he was like, you know, that happens from time to time. So he invited me another week, the same thing happened. So he said, uh, have you ever thought about doing your own TV show? Never in a million years. He said, if you can produce it yourself, like, I'm going to give you all I have. You can produce your own TV show. I'll give it to you. Man, I figured out how to do that in about two hours in my head. <laughs> I said, I'm going to figure this out. Mm. And, bro, that TV show went hard. And that's how the units start moving. Them units was moving. I was, I was mailing them. Back then, it was, you know, you know, MP3 and all that. Tell you my age. I was, man, I couldn't get rid of them fast enough. Hundreds of thousands of people, man. I made so much money fast. And I was grinding. I was producing my own TV show at the time, which a novice just taught myself, self-taught. I was doing concerts. I was producing music. I was recording and learn how to engineer myself. Not only that, I was speaking. I'm one of the first hip-hop artists to ever do concerts in prisons. Hmm. I'm traveling in the prisons doing show. I'm doing everything, overseas, every, everything. And I just, if somebody invited me, I'm coming. Are I you, pass are, up nothing. Are you living like a straight and narrow life while you're doing this? Or are you still kind of, you know? You know what was crazy? I tell people this. The only reason I was, I was at that time, I was disciplined. And I wasn't, you know, living a wild life. I ain't had time to do wrong. Hmm. All I was doing was working. <laughs> like, no time. Of course, I was a commitment there. But say I was challenged. I even had time to be challenged. I was always working. And it kept me out of trouble. And it also added another level of discipline to me. You feel me? Uh, uh, I see uh, the guys that came up, like Chameleon there and Paul Wall. A guy that their youth pastor was a dude that I mentored, you know. Uh, Slim Thug, I remember years ago, he got on a plane and I seen him. He said, man, I seen your TV show, da, 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 da. He was young. And I said, man, bless you. Keep grinding. And Slim was, he still is focused. He relaxed now. Though. Everybody know him as Sugar Daddy Slim. He's so, <laughs> he enjoying his life. But back then, all he did was work and grind. He was so focused. And I told him, I said, bro, you stay like this, you're going to come up. And he stuck to it. And I watched all of them blow up. All of them flourish. Even Rick Ross back in the day. I'm one of the only producers ever dealt with him. Back in the slip and slide days. You feel what I'm saying? And I watched him, boom, blow up. And that relationship came through producing? Through production? Through, pro through producing. I got a friend, a friend of mine named DJ Sykes, which was Trick Daddy's DJ. That's what got me all in the Miami scene and stuff like that. Just real good people, man. Real good people out there, man. And and that's how I, I know about Rick Ross and stuff. So it's just watching everybody just flourish. Even Trey. You know, Trey uh, did gospel hip-hop. He wasn't, I don't think he was a gospel rapper, but he was on one of my compilations before I even met him. You know, back in the day, through another guy who said, man, this dude here, he always, he, he ain't gospel, but he always helping people. Even way back then, <laughs> Trey was helping people. People ain't even know it. You feel me? So I said, man, I told him, I said, man, if he can do some, you know, put some lyrics and it kind of be God-like or whatever, he ain't got to be preaching, whatever. Just as long as ain't no cussing, man, he can get on the, on the compilation, and he did. Hmm. So 
I watched everybody. South Park, Mexican. He used to be a Christian hip hop artist first. People ain't even know that. I ain't never. He didn't never release nothing, but I met him in the beginning stages. You know. You know. So it's man. It's this. It's it's deep history with that. People don't know about his deep history, bro. So what? What was the? Uh, I mean, what made you switch? You know what I'm saying? You was doing good. Did, did the software? How 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 much did the software's wholesale crash play a part in like what you had going on? That didn't affect me at all, to be honest, because you know artists right now live off of show money. That's I lived off of show money anyway. And merchandise, like I was, I, I can't tell you how many shirts, hats, and post. I used to sell my posters too. I can't even count. Like, I made so much money just with that and the music, so it didn't affect it. What had happened was, I'm not a politic guy. Never have been. One of the reasons why my career as a, as just doing street hip hop, secular hip hop. Uh, was somewhat limited. It's never been a politic guy. I don't bullshit. I don't lie. I don't, you know, like we were talking about earlier. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to call you. Call you about 15 minutes knowing you ain't going to call nobody. I don't play them games. But I tell you something, I mean it. And that don't work necessarily in the entertainment business. Bullshit is the language. And I'm not good at bullshit. So, um, but the church system I'm not going to say every church and every preacher. That church system is the most demonic thing on the planet. On the planet. And it was preachers that was trying to buy me because I was so famous back then. You can't buy me. I don't play with God. <laughs> like I don't, You say buy you? What you in, in what sense? Well, it was, so, it was some trying to pay me to go to their church because I had such a big following. You know, TV show, all these kids. Like, I had a huge following. And I was like, nah. Nah, I, I don't get up and give with that. So, so when you were doing these church things, you were just showing just on the on the strength. You would just show up like that. Well, I had I had a policy. If you need me to speak to kids to help them, I do that for free. You can handle expenses, gas, whatever. Cool, I'm gonna do that regardless. But if that music come on and I start rap, you got to pay me because that's my gift. That's my work. And I got to take care of my family. You ain't going to disrespect that. And, um, you, know, if, you know, sometimes I, I had to, like, lock the door on preachers. They was playing with the money. Hmm. I'm like, bro, I'm not the one. So either y'all going to pay me or some people about to get knocked out in this room. And it's sad, but it was some of them like that. But what really drove me out is... Uh, I'm not gonna say no names. He was a powerful preacher, and they they what they they so-called blackballed me because they couldn't control me. I don't live on no controlling base. I'm a man, but like my daddy taught me in the beginning. At the end of the day, I'm a man. I'm not here to control no other man either. I have full respect for what a man does, and I never come in your space and disrespect your house. Your wife, your kids, anything you own, and and never your money. That's a respect. But it's some people, they just, you know, they get their money, and they, they got so many people kissing their ass, they think they can just bully their way on people. That don't work with me. You know, at, I'm talking about on a serious level. Like, it'll be the end of the day before you get me to bow. Because I just, you can't do that. It ain't going to happen. So, so instead of me being on the news, you know, busting an AK-47 <laughs> with some preachers, it wasn't that serious. Because I don't play. Now y'all playing with my money and my family. And I prayed, I prayed to God and he reminded me it was him that blessed me, not, not them. And I, now I got many talents and gifts to make money. So I ventured off really in producing secular artists. I wouldn't even 
trying to even be no artist. I was just producing. Wino, the word wino was just, that was my producing moniker. And pop my trunk and hook a hooker, it just fold over into a rapper. You feel me? Hmm. So, it's a trip. A lot of people don't ask that question. That's the first thing they think in what you just asked, bro. Hmm. How did you go from doing the gospel to the secular? And it hurt a lot of people's feelings when I, when I did that. A lot of people didn't even understand what happened. And at the end of the day, none of that makes you uh, a man of God or what they call a Christian or not. You know, what makes you a man of God is your honesty to him and your commitment. And what they don't know is our first, the first mandate the first ministry a man has, if he's a preacher or not, is to provide for your family. Hmm. And the Bible says a man that doesn't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. An infidel is somebody God don't even hear their prayers. God himself turns his back on. Hmm. So you mean to tell me these preachers who blackball me going to put me in a position to be an infidel? <sighs> My gift is going to keep working. And that's what happened. You know what I mean? You, just, you obviously wasn't the wrong thing because you was blessed in that area. You know what I'm saying? You talking about hookah, 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 which, <laughs> man, I just, you know, I don't know, man. That, that record right there, this is when I was first getting to college or maybe my second year in college. Yeah. I don't remember. Somewhere up in my early college career, like, this record came out of nowhere and it was just tearing parties up, bro. Like, this DJ, this is when I first meeting DJ High C. This is like. That record was so big to the point where major label reps was flying in and coming to my house. They was demanding to come to my house trying to get me to sign over rights to this record and do deals and all this other stuff. One A&R dude, I couldn't even get him out of my, my, my house. He spent the night trying to get me to do deals. Offering millions and millions of dollars. What people don't realize, that's one of the first dance rap records that big ever in the South, ever. That song, massively big, bro. I'm, I'm sitting, I'm listening to you, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to run them down. I'm thinking <laughs> dance song, what had, what had a dance, what? Yeah, and know. the rest came after. <laughs> the rest came after, bro. So, uh, Lean Back, none of that stuff was before that, bro. None yeah, lean of Back it. came like a year or two after that, for sure. Yeah, bro, it was, it was so big, bro. It was so big. And mind you, I produced that for them, for Kiati and AJ, you know. And uh, the only reason I was on the song is uh, Walter D was testing out a, r a record on the radio. And everybody only knew me as a Christian hip hop artist, you know, nominated for a Dove Award, all this other stuff. So I had him testing out a record on the radio and somebody called him and said, hey, that's new wine. He ain't supposed to be on no 97.9. <laughs> As he worship it, like, it pissed me off so bad, bro, when I heard that. Walter, like, yeah. And he let me hear the recording because they would call the people who called up there. I said, man, while I'm mixing the hooker hooker. And I just, man, I spit a bar. And I spit another bar. That's why, if you go back and listen to that song, Kiati's talking about the dance. AJ's talking about the dance. Even MC Quay, who's doing the hook, talking about the dance. I say nothing about the dance. They say, I hear everybody saying, what the hell is going on? What is Wino doing on this song? I'm venting, really pissed off. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it was, it was a trip. And I, told, I said, Walter, I sent him two versions. I said, you ain't got to play that. He say, nigga, this is hot. You, I, I, I'm playing this bird. <laughs> like I said, that's how I ended up on there. So it was even no real intention behind it. Just like Pop My Trunk was no real intention. It blew up in Dallas by itself, organically. I ain't spent a dime and that's crazy that you record. put it out like this is just a demo. I ain't even. Bro, it was so hot I couldn't do nothing about that Pop My Trunk. Like nothing. I couldn't fight it off if I wanted to. The song came and attacked me. Hmm. <laughs> it was told, and you know how hard it is to get a record going and you just, you pushing, you working. No. 
I don't know of anybody else. The only only people you hear of songs doing that is artists who are already big and hot. Nobody knew me. And that song went to the point where when I started doing shows, bro, I walk in with big security. They run up, which one of y'all is wine ho? <laughs> and they thought I wasn't because I'm the skinny dude. And I had these big old, they would run up to my big security. You know, like, no, oh, he is. And they like, and that's when I start wearing a little patch over my little gunshot or whatever. Just, you know, some Batman effect. I was just trying something, you know. And uh, it was it was, it was was fun, man. It was fun and it was a learning experience. How how big did that record get for you? Like, when you were like, man, I can't believe this record that took me here. I'm over here doing this or whatever. Yo, when they was playing in New York and when they was playing in, in L.A. I went to L.A. They summonsed me to the radio station. Hmm. And in all of me hearing my songs being played on the radio, bro, that was the first time I heard a DJ drop it back to back to back to back. He played Pop My Trunk for 15 or 20 minutes. To this day, uh, what's his name, man? He's a big DJ, too. It'll come back to me. He's a producer as well. But he, man, he say, dude, we just ain't never... Heard nothing like this. This is crazy. Like the song got so big, it was big in China and Japan. Uh, the Les Twins, who was the biggest dance group in the world, used it for two and three consecutive years to to compete. Beyonce took Pop My Trunk and toured with it. Like you know, How it, you it stayed on the that? Billboard like, charts for almost two years. Like it never got kicked off. It was I just. I knew, I knew it was God. I knew it was Him for whatever is worth awarding me from all my hard work and pain. Because I've suffered through a lot of things, bro. And uh, being misunderstood, I'm always misunderstood. The entire rap scene, except those who know me intimately, has misunderstood me. That's why when they did the Texas thing in the source, you didn't see me on there. You even seen rappers who never even put an album out on there, but you didn't see me. And the guy who bought the source from Benzino was looking for me. And later on, when he found me, he said, man, I, nobody had your number. Nobody could contact you. I wanted you on this thing. So and that was historical, too. That cover was a story. Yeah, it man. still is. Yeah. And later he did a spread on me. And uh, and just to be 100 with you, I asked God, I said, God, why do you didn't allow me to be on that cover? And he said, I want you to look at it. And I looked real deeply at it. And I seen all the different rappers and, and everyone, everybody that was on there was connected to one another somehow. Connected to Swish House, connected to Rap A Lot, connected to Rec Shop, connected to uh, Suave House. I seen where one helped another and another reached back to help another. He say, if that if you was on a cover and it was real, it would just be me and you on there. Mm. Just me and God, because not a soul helped me. Everything I did, I did it all myself. I grinded with my own shoes, own sweat, own tears, people rejecting the music, people laughing at me. People saying you're too skinny, you're built funny, you know, you're ugly, your voice too deep, you ain't gonna be able to make. I heard everything, mm. and I still achieved every goal I set for myself, every single one, and I'm still achieving goals. Yeah, yeah. man, tell me, uh, cause pop my trunk, that was what, oh six, seven, somewhere over there. You know your history, oh six. Yeah, yeah. It started in late oh five, like it started. To Bubble in 05 and then it just oh, hit. It was smashed. Yeah. It was yeah. bam in 06. Yeah. yeah. Man, so, okay. Because this is what tripped me out. You know what I mean? Because uh, they were saying, like, you know, with the whole Iggy thing, I was reading up on that and they were saying, y'all met like a couple years around there. How do you meet somebody? She ain't from the age, right? It was in uh, 2000. I, I got to be limited to how much I talk about this. Gotcha. So, uh, you say the name or whatever. Okay, gotcha. But, um, it was at it was in 2008, and I met her through uh, Mr. Lee, 
People don't even know that. No you, shit. <laughs> yeah, it's just blowing your mind. It's even more crazy. <laughs> yeah, what? Mr. Lee, it's two things. It's a couple of things about Mr. Lee. Number one, he's a mastermind. People don't even know it. This dude is like a scientist of producers. Don't get it twisted. This dude oh, knows. Oh, the GOAT, for sure. As far as Texas is concerned, go to all this. I always can note somebody's gift. He is off the, it's just off a scale. So when we met each other, I, it's like he, he knew me. And I knew him. It's like two dudes. Like I was like, oh yeah, you ain't who they think you are, nigga. You, you, you know what I'm saying? That's how we met. So it, it, it was a uh, uh, some Asian guys who had tons of money, tons of money, and they uh, they were starting a label, and they wanted Mr. Lee to be the producer and just run a portion of the label, and. Uh, Mr. Lee was wise, so he knew he needed a team of producers. And he sought me out because he know if it's a lot of work, that's what I'm good at, you know. So he called me to uh, come through so they can meet me. And I went over there, man, and uh, I see this pretty girl sitting in the, in the lobby. So I'm like, what's up? And he and Mr. Lee know I'm, you know, I like the exotics. You feel me? Uh, me uh, Walter D used to say, man, the kind of women I've seen you with don't make no kind of sense. I said, mm -hmm. well, be honest. Because I, when I got shot in the face, I told myself, I'm going to be with women who people say they can't be with me. Like the ones that's, that's too high to reach, them the only ones I want. So uh, Mr. Lee say, hey, man, this, this girl, you know, she was hitting me when she was, young like 16 years old on myspace trying to come to america and saying she listens to houston hip-hop <laughs> a little white girl from australia like that's crazy ain't it so <laughs> and uh she don't know if she want to be a model or a rapper and all this other stuff man and he told her when she was like i think 15 or 16 he said look you know it's inappropriate for me to be talking to you so when you hit 18 look me up maybe we can work together he was just trying to like, hey, you know, get up there. This, you know, I ain't finna get caught up in no bullshit. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah of course. Yeah. So she told her mama that Mr. Lee was gonna make her a superstar. She amped it. So on her 18th birthday, she came to Houston. <laughs> <laughs> so I met her on her birthday, bro. So she's sitting in the lobby, Mr. Lee, like, I don't even know why she had her. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? So, so she's not with these people y'all supposed to be meeting with. This is just a random. She fight. showed up. And he just being courteous, told her where he is, and just that's how Mr. Lee is. He just nice like that. And then when he seen me, he said, Oh, thank you. I already know you can deal with that. I don't you know what I'm saying. So that's how that happened, man. And and she was she was actually dope. Creatively dope. How she dressed, style, she artists, know how to paint, draw. She was gifted, and I'm like connected to people like that because I can do anything. I can draw, paint, do anything, build something, sculpt, whatever. So we just kicked it off and coming like that. So that's how that started, you know. And of course, it went to hell, but that's how it started. Hmm. It's damn. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it's it Are you scratching yeah. your head about the Mr. Lee? These little connections. I mean, all these, off. all these things of. <laughs> She's coming around 16 years yeah. old talking about she listening to Houston rap and then she pops up 18 at the studio on the day y'all have it's just a bunch of random shit going on you know what I'm yeah, saying it's crazy man it's and then crazy. so I mean yes yeah, okay I got you so I mean at the end but for the record you could say that you would you say that you kind of groomed her in a sense to be an artist and understand the way the music business goes I, I would say it like this number one you can't make somebody nothing that ain't there anyway I just helped her see where it was, you know. And uh, I did that for a lot of artists that people don't know. I'm not gonna put them out there. I, like I said earlier, I don't, like some people, they just want all the shine. And uh, I like to see people come up. I like to people, see people who they think can't do it, do it. And she was one of them. Cause everywhere I took her, they like, she ain't, ain't no way she can't be no rapper. She need to be modeling all this. They was down on the left and right. And that just motivated me even more. 
And she got good at it, real good at it. But how she showed up, uh, you know, with T.I. was different than how she showed up with me. I knew that she would be a mega star if she stuck to pop rap. I knew the hood in the black community wasn't going to respect you trying to do that. And it backfired on her. But as we see, her greatest hit is the one that was pop, hip hop. And that's the stuff that I was producing on, which is heat, straight heat. Yeah, so man, it's 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 2022, man. Uh, I know we you talked a little bit about you wanted to do, yeah. you know, pop my trunk potentially. You know what I'm saying? Well, we can say it, you know, remix, yeah. re-releasing pop yeah. my trunk. I am gonna re-release pop my trunk. It's just when, but it's gonna be this year. Yeah, yeah. You got the documentary. You know what I'm saying? I right, right now too. You know what I mean? When thugs fly, boy. Yeah, yeah. That was a hard one for me because I don't like exposing my life like that. You know. It was a part in there in that documentary though. You talk about exposing your life, man. It was a part where they was like, Man, yeah, man, you got two wives. And he was like, Yeah, I don't really want to, you know. <laughs> I know that set really people back. That, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um it's um uh, number one it's illegal to have two wives, so I don't. <laughs> and uh get that clear out the way, yeah. <laughs> but you have people in your life that, that really loves you and take care of you and you return that favor. I've learned to only have real, authentic people in my life. You can't get close to me unless you're real and authentic. You can't have something in the back of your head, okay, when I get to this level, I'm gonna do this, do this to him. You have to be all the way 100. I don't care, it's, I have no motivation. I have no desire to be around people like that. I'm a family man through and through. And when you're my family, I ride for you and I literally would die for you, you know. And that's how we are in my family, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Well man, uh man, it's been live as hell, man. You got anything before we close about here? Bro, I like you, man. You 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 keep doing this here. Cause the way you do it, it can do nothing but grow. You I know? appreciate that, man. Yeah, how you set up you you just one hundred percent yourself. And it's dope. Man, you know, I appreciate so, it, man. But uh, hit me up on IG. Everybody, uh, go see the uh, When Thugs Fly documentary. It's on Great Tubi. Great documentary, yeah. yeah. Free. Check it out. And when you check it out, share it with a friend because it's all about helping others. And uh, and at the same time, I can't believe I'm telling people to watch it because I don't like exposing <laughs> my life like that. It's out there now, bro. But you my wife, she's a filmmaker. And... Uh, she just, man, for years, she just saying, man, your story, your story, your story. People need to hear it. They don't know who you are. People going on rumors, this and that. They need to know who you are, man. So my children on there, like, it just, it really exposes who I am. And watching that gives you a good foundation of who I really am. And if you think you know who I am, you don't. Hmm. But you can find out who I am by watching that. With thugs fly on Tubi, man. Um, I done watched it a couple of times, so you got a few streams off of me already. You know what I'm saying? So already. Yeah, I definitely check out that with thugs fly, man. It's wine, oh, new wine or hefe wine. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> As it's going already. by right now, man. This has been an honor, man. I appreciate you coming through, man. Hey, bro, it's been an honor to sit down with somebody real. Appreciate it, man. Already, it's the Donnie Easter podcast. Hefe wine, we out of here, man. Peace. Oh, yeah. Daddy Houston. Daddy Houston. Daddy Houston. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Subscribe to the Danny Houston Podcast, man.